And let's begin to give glory to God tonight. Let's give him the praise that is due to his name. Celebrate him from the depth of your heart is worthy. Give thanks and give praise unto the name of the Most High God. Appreciate him and celebrate him. He's worthy of all praise. He's worthy of all glory. He's worthy of all honor. All adoration belongs to him. Celebrate him from the depth of your heart. Glorify him from the depth of your heart. Make sure your voice is registered on high this evening. Thank him for all the answers he has granted to all of your prayers, your intercessions, your supplications. Give glory to God. Give praise to his name. Celebrate his faithfulness. Father, we say thank you. We bless your holy name. And now begin to ask him to speak to you tonight. I've come here for an encounter with you tonight. Let your word come forth with power. Let it transform my life. Thank you, mighty God. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Our Father, we have come before you this evening to give glory and praise to your name. We thank you for hearing and answering all of our prayers. And now tonight, our eyes are upon you. We ask that you will speak to us. By your word tonight, let everyone's life be changed. We give you the praise and the glory for it. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Somebody believe, say loud, amen. amen. Give Jesus a big hand of praise and please, you may be seated in his presence. Welcome to 2021, your year of supernatural turnaround. So shall it be in the name of Jesus Christ. Our teaching series for our midweek services in this month has been captioned Understanding the Obedience That Works. Understanding the obedience that works. And this evening is good that we are reminded yet again from the word of the Lord that we serve a covenant keeping God and not a Father Christmas God. We serve a covenant keeping God and not a Father Christmas God. In Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 20 and verse 21, we see the strength of the covenant of God here. He said, if you can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, that there should not be day and night in their season. He said, then may also my covenant with David, my servant, that he should not have his son to reign upon his throne and with the Levites, the priest, my ministers be broken. In other words, God makes it clear that what keeps day and night exchanging is covenant. And in other words, if the covenant is what keeps day and night exchanging, then the word of the Lord is also bound by the same force. There is no day that the day refused to break and no night that the night refused to fall. In the same vein, there is nothing that can keep the, stop, the covenant from working. So our God is a covenant-keeping God. If it's a covenant-keeping God, then it means that until our part is played for the delivery of any provision of the kingdom, God is not committed to his release. In Psalm chapter 89 and verse 34, he said, my covenant will I not break, neither will I alter the conditions that have come forth out of my lips. So very clearly, when the condition is met, the integrity of God is bound to bring forth the promise. And that is why it's important for us to understand that until that condition is met, God is not committed. For example, we know from scriptures that one cannot succeed in any endeavor without being diligent. 
in his business. In Proverbs 22 and verse 29, says that a man that is diligent in his business, he shall stand before kings, he shall not stand before mean men. He cannot end up average if he's diligent in his pursuit. That means that diligence is the pathway to excellence. For anyone to excel in any endeavor, diligence is God's demand. In John chapter 5 verse 17, Jesus speaking, he said, my father walketh hitherto and I walk. So even the success of the father is a product of labor. The success of the son is also a product of labor. In John chapter 9 verse 4, Jesus speaking, he said, I must walk the walks of him that sent me while it is day, for the night cometh when no man can walk. So very clearly from scriptures we are made to understand that when it comes to anything that looks like excellence in life, the pathway to it, the covenant demand is diligence. In fact, the scripture makes clear to us that the slogan will beg in harvest. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 4. So diligence is not only the pathway to excellence, but it is a covenant demand for abundance. We are also made to understand in scriptures that the slogan is the one that will continue to seek convenience. And therefore, as a result of that, it will embrace failure. In Proverbs 20, 22 and verse 13, we are told there very clearly, it says, The slothful man said, There is a lion without, and therefore I will be slain in the street. I can't go out there and risk it. I can't go there out, my, out there on my own, at my own peril. And as a result of that, you find that individual embracing failure. In Proverbs 10 and verse 4, He become a poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent make it rich. So diligence is a covenant demand for the positive outcome of any destiny. Your potential can die dormant if diligence is not applied. So while God says that the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God, that means that every believer is pregnant with unlimited potential. But the pressure of diligence is required for that potential to be made manifest. What that means, therefore, is this. That there is potential does not mean there will be manifestation. Diligence is the force required to forge the potential within into public manifestation. That is why Celebrating the promise is child's play. Locating the demand and engaging with it is what turns that promise into a reality. That is why God's servant has said over the years that in the kingdom, children celebrate promises. But the mature locate demands. They seek out for the demand because until the demand is met, the promise is not realized. I pray tonight that for each one of us, as we begin to position ourselves with meeting the demands of scriptures, we shall begin to see the manifestation of the promise of God in the various departments of our lives. Somebody believe it, say a loud amen. You listen to the two testimonies that we heard this night. They are testimonies of those who located the demand and kept it. The first person said, in the same year, miscarriage, loss of job, all manner of things. But according to her, I was not discouraged from my kingdom commitment. And as she kept the demand, God kept the promise. For somebody here, God will step in to fulfill the promise. Somebody believe you say loud amen. I said somebody believe you say loud amen. Therefore, it's important to know that where our obedience stops is where God's blessing stops flowing. Where our obedience stops 
is where God's blessing stops flowing. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 1 and verse 2. If you hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord your God and observe to do all his commandments which I commanded this day, the Lord your God will set you on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon thee and overtake thee if. So if you don't keep the demands, the blessing will stop flowing. It means, therefore, that where our obedience stops is where the flow stops. If you want to keep the flow of his blessing continuous in your life, then your obedience must be sustained. I pray tonight that the grace for sustained obedience will come afresh upon our lives in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we discover from scripture that not all obedience works. Not all obedience works. That means that you and I must begin to look into the scripture to discover the order of obedience that works so that our engagement will not be in vain. And tonight we are going to look at two dimensions of obedience that works for the believer. Number one is what we call good conscience-based obedience. Good conscience-based obedience. In 2 Chronicles chapter 25 and verse 2, the Bible tells us, it says concerning this king that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. We must come to understand that God is interested in your heart. I've said this before that it is the state of your heart that determines the weight of your act. God will weigh your action on the basis of the state of your heart. First Samuel chapter 2 verse 3, God is a God of knowledge by whom actions are weighed. So what you do will be weighed by the state of your heart. We are also made to understand from scriptures in 2 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 9 that the eyes of the Lord go to and fro the earth. He said they are searching for a man whose heart is perfect towards him. Searching for a man whose heart is perfect towards him. So God makes it very clear that when it comes to our actions, it is determined by the authenticity of our hearts. And in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 19, the word of God makes it even clearer. When it tells us there, it says, holding faith with a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made a shipwreck of their destiny. They have destroyed the future. Because they have put away the conscience. It's important for you and I to understand, therefore, that our conscience is a vital custodian of our destinies. If your conscience is displaced, your destiny may be destroyed. That is why you and I must continue to ensure that our conscience is not silenced in the journey of life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul the Apostle speaking in verse 1 and verse 2, he made this very clear statement. He says, seeing that we have this ministry, we have received mercy and we faint not. Look at what he says. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Dishonesty may be hidden, but to compromise your delivery. He said it is hidden, yes, but we have renounced it. We have renounced 
the hidden things, the dishonest things, we have renounced them. We are refusing to handle the word of God craftily. But we are commending ourselves to every man's conscience in truth. You see, according to scripture, therefore, it is made clear that we must be tireless in renouncing all secret things of dishonesty in order to maintain a pure conscience. We must be tireless in renouncing whatever is a secret thing of dishonesty in order to maintain a good conscience. Paul the Apostle speaking in the book of Acts chapter 24 and verse 16. The Bible tells us there, it says, And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience that is void of offense toward God and toward man. A conscience that is void of offense. A conscience that is continuously confident in a stand. A conscience that is not corrupted by compromise toward God and toward men. This is so important. You see, this is because the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1 and verse 2. Hebrews 10 verse 1 and verse 2. It says, for the law having a been a shadow of things to come and not the very image of the things of, of things can never with those sacrifices which they have offered year by year continually make the commas there unto perfect. Verse 2. It says that for then, for then would they have not would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once Paul should have had no more conscience of sins so there is the conscience that is polluted by sin and this is what the scripture is showing us so you and I must ensure that our conscience is guarded so that it is not defiled those who defy the conscience defile the conscience. Those who try to silence the conscience corrupt the conscience. And as a result of that, their obedience cannot produce results. It's so important, therefore, for each one of us to continue to guard the state of our conscience. Please hear this and hear it very well. Your conscience within you is always testifying for or against you. It is always testifying for or against you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 12. 2 Corinthians, sorry, chapter 1 and verse 12. We are told this very clearly. It says, for our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience. Your conscience is a testifier either for or against you. When you are going off course it is speaking against you. When you are going on the right course it is speaking for you. That is why you can't be going into error and the conscience is not shouting. It is always speaking either for or against you. And that is why you and I must become very conscious of what the voice of the conscience is saying per time. If you defy the conscience, you defile the conscience. And when you defile the conscience, you make a shipwreck of your destiny. My prayer tonight is that no one here will wreck their destinies. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I said no one here will wreck their destinies. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. No one here will wreck their destinies. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11. He said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. We persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God. And I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. We are made manifest unto God and also made manifest in your consciences. I'd like us to take note of this tonight. That I said earlier that your conscience is either testifying for or against you. And that conscience speaks toward God. In other words, 
when your conscience is speaking, God is hearing. It is telling God, this man is missing it. This woman is missing it. God is hearing the voice of the conscience. So it is made manifest towards God, but God says not only that, it will also eventually show toward men. It will eventually expose itself toward men. That is why you and I must continuously monitor the voice of our conscience. Because when, you're, when, you're, when your conscience is speaking contrary to you towards God, your obedience on the earth will be silenced. God says, go out and win souls. And you are going out and winning souls. But you are also violating the law of God in another area. Your obedience for winning souls will be silenced by the testimony of your conscience against you. Is somebody getting what God is saying? Now, what that means is that we are running a delicate race. Because the Bible tells us already that we already have one that is called the accuser of the brethren. Who is he? The devil. So Satan is accusing you and then another one, which is your conscience, is a witness. In every court case, you will always have the prosecutor and he will bring witnesses. So your conscience becomes a witness against you in the court of heaven, thereby silencing the outcome of your earthly obedience. That is why it is vital. Never violate the voice of your conscience because if not, Satan has gathered a witness. When Satan is accusing such a man before God, the conscience is saying, yes, it is true. He did it. It is true. He did it. And when the witness is from within you, then there is no recourse. How many of you know that in a court case, when you are the one who chose to plead guilty, there is no need going forward. The case, is, the case is finished. When it is you that said, I'm guilty, I did it. The case is finished. And when your conscience speaks, it is you that spoke. Is somebody getting it? That is why we must continuously, at every point in time, be conscious of the voice of the conscience. When your conscience is out of place, your obedience is displaced. That is why you find people today who are doing particular things God is commanding. But yet there is no result. Because in the court of heaven, Satan is accusing and the conscience is witnessing. But I pray tonight that for somebody here, tonight will mark the night of rescue. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I said I pray that for somebody here. Tonight will mark a night of rescue. In the name of Jesus Christ. I said I pray that tonight will mark the night of rescue. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The good news is this. Tonight we have the privilege of partaking of the communion table which carries on it the flesh and the blood of Jesus. And in the book of Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14, look at what the Bible says. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, do what? Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So, the communion table provides a platform through which our conscience can be revitalized. What do I mean? As a man goes before God in repentance, the blood of Jesus has the effect of cleansing his sin. But also we see here that the blood of Jesus has the assignment of also purging the record of the conscience. So that the conscience is no longer speaking against you. So that the voice of the conscience is not contrary to you. But it is twofold. First of all, there's repentance. And second of all, there's the engagement of the mystery of the blood. When those two are combined, the voice of the conscience is revitalized. 
not to speak contrary to you, but rather to testify on your behalf. But God makes it very clear that that testimony only continues as long as you are purged from dead works. So you can say, oh, I partook of the communion or I repented of my sin yesterday and continue in sin today again, expecting the conscience to speak for you. No. It is only a conscience that is maintained by a life of sanctification that will allow its voice to speak positively on your behalf. I pray tonight that via the encounter of this night, whatever it is that has been causing your conscience to speak against you, may tonight be a night of turnaround. May the blood be your blood of rescue. And may your path be set on the straight path in the name of Jesus Christ. May your feet be set on the straight path in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What God is saying to us is very simple. We must continue to pay close attention to the voice of our conscience. The word of God makes it clear that it is better for you to endure grief for conscience sake. In other words, when you see something that is wrong and you know that going the right way will cause you particular, will bring particular consequences, he says it's better. Let's look at it very quickly. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 19. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 19. He said, for this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience towards God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, this is thankworthy. It is better for there to be a consequence for obeying the conscience. It is far better. So you and I must esteem the voice of the conscience above our earthly comfort. We must esteem it. Esteem the voice of the conscience. You are in a workplace and they tell you, look, come, let us, let us connive together. And the person who told you is your senior. And you know that if you don't connive with him, it will have a, a consequence on your job. They say, well, after all, it's my senior. If I don't do it now, I will, I will be going through all manner in this place. Why? Because as far as you are concerned, if you don't do it, you may lose your job. God said it is better to lose your job for conscience sake. He said it is tank worthy. Please hear this. There is no consequence that is high enough to sacrifice your conscience. There is no consequence that is high enough to sacrifice your conscience. No consequence. High enough for anyone to sacrifice his conscience. Hear this and hear it very well. I was reading recently in the scriptures and I saw something that caught my attention. When the scripture talks about those that go to hell, among them it mentioned the fearful. And who are the fearful? The Bible makes clear that those fearful are the ones that are called cowards. Who for fear will compromise their stand with God. I'd like you to understand that there is no consequence, no matter what it is. You know what Jesus said? He said, fear not them that can only kill the body and can do nothing with the spirit, but rather fear him that after he has destroyed the body can send the spirit to hell. Don't be afraid of those. What is the worst they can do? Don't fear him that says he can kill the body and can do nothing with the spirit. He said, but rather fear the one who not only has the ability to destroy the body but also send the soul and the body to hell please hear this and hear it very well no man breathing God's air should end your fear above God no man breathing God's air should end your fear above God 
when this becomes a reality in you, then your conscience is no more on offer for sacrifice. It's so important that you and I understand this. This is what makes obedience work. When your conscience is confident towards God, then your obedience is responded to by God. We have to wake up. We have to ensure that our conscience comes back to life. We can't afford to be eroded with the corruptions of our world. It is time to guard the conscience consciously. I pray tonight that for anyone whose conscience may have already been silenced or seared with hot iron, may it be quickened again in the name of Jesus. Somebody believe you say loud amen. I said, somebody believe you say a loud amen. amen. Somebody believe you say a loud amen. amen. So the first kind of obedience that works, we said, is the good conscience-based obedience. Number two is the hope-driven obedience. The hope-driven obedience. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 4, it said, to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. And in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, we are told for those who are in Christ, he said that we are joined again unto a living or a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Hope has to do with expectation. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 10 he said that he that treasures will treasure in hope. It's important to note that hope is one of the foundations of our spiritual adventure. It is one of the foundations of our spiritual adventure. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18. The Bible tells us there, Hebrews 6 and verse 18, that by two immutable things by which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold on the hope that is set before us. So hope is one of the foundations, one of the principal pursuits of our Christian adventure. It is so important that you and I understand this. And this means that if our obedience is going to have effect, then it must have hope. Hope means it must be done in expectation. In the book of Proverbs 23 verse 18, it says, Surely there is an end, and thine expectation shall not be cut off. So it is those with expectation that are permitted to experience God's manifestation. This is why it is so important for you and I to ensure that as we obey God, we do so with expectation. Our hearts must be set. In the book of Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 11, the Bible makes us to understand this very clearly. It says, Hebrews 6 and verse 11, and we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope to the end. In other words, don't just start in hope, stay in hope. You are obeying God. Stay with expectation. Surely there is an end. And thine expectation shall not be cut off. Over the years, God's servant our father has spoken over and again about how many people are just one step to the end. And they give up. And that's why the Bible says we must show the same diligence. Preserving our hope unto the end. What is the end? The testimony. Every time you are obeying God, don't just obey God empty hearted. Obey him with expectation. Obey him with expectation. You heard the second testifier whose testimony was read today. He said, I heard the testimony of the young man who received a scholarship to go abroad. 
So I began engaging. Engaging with what? With expectation. Surely there is an end. And thine expectation shall not be cut off. And before you knew it, scholarship started coming. One of the strange things, I don't know if you heard what was said in that testimony. The scholarship arrived before the admission arrived. You have not found school, yet you have found money to go to school. He said, and after that, then the admission arrived. Scholarship to go abroad, admission abroad, everything landed together. Why? Surely there is an end. When your obedience cons is consistent with the end in view, then the end of it is sure to come. The Bible tells us, it says, concerning Jesus' obedience. In Hebrews 12 and verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. What does he say? He said, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He said he was despising the shame. And now he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What was the joy? He saw himself on that throne. So everything he was going through here was of no consequence. He said, let this same mind be in you. Philippians 2 verse 5. That was also in Christ Jesus. He said, who though he was equal with God, thought it not robbery to be considered equal with God. He said, but he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man and was found in the fashion of a man. He humbled himself and became what? obedient unto death even the death of the cross wherefore God has highly exalted him he saw the end and because he saw the end he arrived at it he saw the end in your engagement what do you see that's the question you must ask yourself what do you see in your obedience to God what do you see in your pursuit of the lost, what do you see? Because surely there is an end. But what is the end? Your expectation. So it is your expectation that determines the conclusion. I pray tonight that from this season onward, your expectation shall never shift. The problem with many is not that they lack expectation, but that they don't sustain expectation. It's not that they lack expectation. Now, somebody's in this year, God has spoken concerning the year that this is our year of turnaround. And somebody's saying, this is October. Nothing has turned around yet. Well, I don't think anything can happen again. As a result of that, they started with expectation, but they didn't stay with expectation. Now, think about this. The last night before Joseph would go to the palace, it was not like a bright light was shining in his cell. He was sleeping in there like every other night. It looked like the routine would repeat the same the next morning. But suddenly when the day came, a knock was at his cell. The king is looking for you. And the Bible says that, he said, until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. There were many trials, but the word was intact. He kept it in his hand. What was what he saw? He saw that one day his brethren would be bowing to him and it was not in jail. They don't come to bow in jail. So he knew that the jail was a temporary situation. It was about to exchange for a position of authority. I don't know what your situation is, but God's word has not changed. He still said 2021 is your year of turnaround. And as you hold on to the word of the Lord, the word will come to pass. Somebody believe it, say louder, amen. I said the word will come to pass. God is not a man that he should lie. He's not the son of man that he should adjust his statement. He cannot transfer what belongs to this year to next year. He cannot move what belongs to this week to next week. God is not a man that he should lie. Whatever he said is what he means. He means 
what he says and he says what he means say with me the word of the lord will come to pass say louder like you mean it the word of the lord will come to pass it doesn't matter what it looks like 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 joseph was there for years but the word of god could not fail that last night he woke up like every other morning he was carrying out normal prison duties but suddenly the king began to seek for him and that day those who imprisoned him began saluting him somebody's story here is changing i said somebody's story is changing if you believe it say louder amen somebody's story is changing god is saying therefore very simply obey in hope obey in what obey in hope as you obey god keep your expectation in view obey in hope i see your testimony arriving colorfully Amen. lift up your hand to heaven and give glory to god for his word you have received this evening father thank you for your word are you thanking god for his word appreciate him glorify him thank you for your word that has come my way tonight blessed be your holy name in jesus precious name we have prayed before we go any further tonight there are those who are here at the youth chapel in Canaan land and across all of our various zones you have not surrendered your life to jesus you have not made him the lord and the savior of your life you don't have a genuine relationship with god yes you may be going through the various motions but you don't have genuine connection wherever you are tonight this is your opportunity this is your time and this is your hour you want to surrender to jesus and have him as lord over your life quickly rise on your feet now i want to pray with you wherever you are quickly god bless you quickly god bless you don't let anything hold you down quickly god bless you god bless you god bless you are you clapping for jesus the one who saves the one who delivers thank you lord also, there are those who need to rededicate their lives to Jesus. Something has gone wrong. You know it. Your conscience has been testifying against you. It has been giving you warning. You know you have been missing your step. You have been going off course. And you need a new beginning. You want to repent so that you can be renewed and have a brand new walk with God. Wherever you are tonight, you want to rededicate your life to Jesus. Quickly also rise your feet right now. Quickly, God bless you. God bless you. Rise on your feet all over this place. Don't let anything hold you down. Give Jesus a big hand, everybody, as they're rising everywhere. It's worthy of all the praise and it's worthy of all the glory. Thank you, Jesus. If you have done that in response to the first and the second call, quickly begin to make your way forward towards the altar right now as we get set to pray. Begin to make your way. God bless you. It's not too late to join the others who are coming. Please hasten your steps. Hasten your steps as you come. I thought somebody was clapping for Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Now, lift up your right hand and pray this prayer after me. Please do the same in all the various locations. Pray this prayer after me. Say after me, Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I am a sinner. I cannot help myself, but I know you died for me. On the third day, you rose again just to save me. Jesus, come into my life as my Lord and Savior. Take control of me from this day forward. I will follow you. No turning back. 
I will serve you. No turning back. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Keep your hand lifted. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you today for these precious ones. They have come today to receive Jesus as Lord. Now give them grace to keep following after you all the days of their lives. We declare that none of these will ever turn back from following you. Thank you, Father, for doing it. In Jesus' precious name we have prayed. Amen and amen. God bless you. Congratulations. It's a brand new day. Please follow the kingdom, friends. They will guide you. Shall we rise, everybody? Thank you, Jesus. I said, thank you, Jesus. We are going to pray for yourself tonight. Please let the officials get towards the table. And ask the Lord, Lord, as I partake of this table tonight, let the blood of Jesus purge my conscience. Let the blood purge my conscience. Pray for yourself from the depth of your heart. Let the blood purge my conscience. Let it purge my conscience. Let it purge my conscience. My conscience. Purging it from dead works. Purging it to serve the living God. Let the blood tonight purge my conscience. Let the blood tonight purge my conscience. Let it revitalize my conscience. Let it quicken my conscience. In the name of Jesus Christ, speak from the depth of your heart. Speak with faith in your heart. To purge it from dead works. Thank you, mighty God. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we declare this table and every table set in every location connected to this service today, we declare it as the flesh and the blood of Jesus. Amen. As we partake of this table tonight, let everyone's conscience be cleansed from dead works. Let our conscience be quickened by the power of the blood. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we partake of this table tonight, should there be anyone that is afflicted in the body, tormented by the wicked, we declare that this table is a table of